In conversation with Russell Brooks, Russell Brooks is a Canadian author of Barbadian Descent. Jamron is a second book in the Eddie Burrow series and his fifth thriller, along with Pandora's Succession on Savory Delicacies, She'll Run, and the Demeter Code. Brooks was once an aspiring sprinter who specialized in the 100 meter, 200 meter, and 4th and 100 meter relay. He represented Canada at the World University Games in 1999 in Palm de Mallorca, Spain. He was also on Team Quebec at the Gio de la Francophine in 1997 and 2001. Both aired in Antananarivo, Madagascar, and Ottawa, Ontario, respectively. Brooks attended Indiana University in Bloomington, Ihen, on a track and field scholarship. He graduated with a degree in biology and a minor in psychology. He currently lives in Montreal. And on today's episode of Photo Interview, it's my utmost pleasure and joy to have on the show today, Russell Brooks. How are you doing, Russell? I'm doing great. I'm happy to be here. Absolutely. It's lovely, actually, to have you on the show today. You have such an amazing and captivating bio. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, Russell, you know, could you tell us about your book? And I actually went would like to say that may reading through your different titles and Amazon actually sounds very amazing and quite captivating with, to me. And I love us to start this conversation with one of your books titled She'll Run, which is the first book in the series of Eddie Barrow series. I'd love to ask you, how does this book come about? What inspired you to write She'll Run? Well, well with She'll Run, yeah. um, if I were to ask you, have you ever had a goal in life that you worked so hard to achieve, but you kept missing your mark because the right people were never paying attention? Mm. Has that ever happened? Well, I know many people that's happened to, and it's happened to me also. I mean, mm. there's, there's a lot of us, I'm sure, that have experienced that. Well, this is the story of Eddie Barrow. He's a, his dream is of being an author, but he's, Stuck working a part. Uh, he's stuck working a job that he doesn't really like. Well, he's working in a bookstore, and he lost his job and his girlfriend on the same day. Oh. And he comes home to find an eviction notice because his best friend and roommate has not been paying his share of the rent. So he's literally hit rock bottom, and he doesn't have a lot of support from his parents or his family. And mm. you know, he's literally hit rock bottom. So his best friend and his girlfriend come up with this cockamamie scheme. This cockamamie idea of a publicity stunt where Eddie Barrow engages in SM with wow. a celebrity for the wow. purpose of deliberately getting caught so that his name wow. gets splashed all over the press. Okay. And using that type of infamy, he's hoping to get a book deal through the back door because publishers and agents will see him. Well, he has a name. So he'd be more attractive to a publisher, so he would be more marketable. However, oh. the market, yeah. Now, it seemed like a good idea at first, and Eddie, who was re reluctant to go through with this because it's not who he, that's not the type of person he is, okay? Mm. But he decides to go along with it because he figures he has nothing left to lose. And he's very desperate as well. So oh. he goes along with the idea. They choose their mark, their celebrity. But the problem is, is that the plan backfires horribly when the celebrity mm. is murdered and Eddie is framed for it. So right oh. now, Eddie, yeah, he's famous, but for the wrong reasons, because right now he and his best friends are on the run from the police and the real killers, which puts oh. Eddie in a very difficult position to try to solve the case himself in order to clear his own name. Wow. So, wow, this is quite... That's quite an amazing adventure, really. And you talking about it sounds quite deep and quite fascinating to me, really. So thank you for mentioning. And if you have a copy of it there with you, I'd love yes, you to show to the camera just so we can see what it looks like. Beautiful cover, even. And I'd thank like you. to ask you, how do you come up with the title, Chill Run, you know, of all the titles? Would you like to talk well, about the making of that? Well, titles, I mean... That name titles of books, you know, I go through several of them and somehow Chill Run, Chill Run came to me very easily because uh -huh. the story takes place in the winter in Montreal oh. and Eastern Townships. 
And if any if anyone's ever been to Montreal in the winter, you know how cold our winters can get. We can get like uh, minus forty degrees wow. at some at some day, uh, on some occasions. It didn't happen. I don't think it happened this year. This year we had an unusually warm winter, but oh. there are other parts of Canada that are just as cold or even colder than Montreal. But the story takes place um, in the in the winter, and That's... and the story is about Eddie Barrow. He's on the run, so chill run. Simple name. <laughs> it's a cheer on, really. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what it is. A chill run. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing. Really, you know, Dan, you have the follow up book in the name of Jam Ron. I love to ask yeah. you what inspired you to write Jam Ron considering well, the controversial subject of violence towards the LGBT community. Would you love to talk about that? So I'll definitely love to talk about it because the subject is so relevant. It's still relevant today, even yeah. though Jam was inspired by inspired by a true story that happened in Jamaica in mm. on was it, uh, July. I think it was July 21st, 2013. Wow. I know it. Uh, I know it happened in 2013 because I was still writing the Demeter Code I was still putting the finishing touches on the Demeter Code when when um, news broke um, from Jamaica of uh, of a teenager, a young teenager. I think he was around 16 years old. His name was Dwayne Jones. And mm-hmm. what he did is that he attended a straight dance party um, oh. outside, outside of Montego Bay, and he came dressed as a woman. And the truth is, nobody knew that he was a guy. And he pulled it off, but his one mistake, his fatal mistake, is when he recognized a girl from his church, he confided in her. And she turned around and outed him to all of her male friends. And that's when things went downhill. He was confronted in the parking lot. I think there are three or four guys who confronted him in the parking lot. And he managed to get away from them. But however, the following morning, the following morning, his body was found on the side of the road, not too far from the nightclub. He had been oh. he had been beaten, he had been stabbed, shot, and run over with a vehicle. Wow. That's what they did to him. And the what's even more what's even more unfortunate is the fact that there were over three hundred people, over three hundred people in attendance at that party, and they all claimed that they didn't see a thing. Wow. And as of today. Um, uh, Dwayne's killers have never been caught. Wow. No arrests have been, and it's it's very sad because if you go online, I remember I remember um, I remember going on Facebook, and I read that's I read in the news the Jamaica Glean, Gleaner, they they had printed a news story that the um, J flag, which is Jamaica's LGBTQ activist group. Yeah. Their offices caught fire and it was a total loss. And wow. the comments, the comments were so abhorrent. I won't even repeat, I won't even repeat <laughs> some of those comments that I that I wow. read. All I can say is that the comments were along the lines of like, oh, they got what they deserved, or uh, I mean, this is um, this is um, talking about um, uh, um, what's it? What Gomorrah and um, and you know what? I think you know what I mean. But yeah, um, I'm not. I didn't even come up the road right now. But I mean, the the comments were so hateful, so homophobic. It was it was so disturbing. I mean, I'm sure that a lot of those comments violated Facebook's policies for. I mean, for this type of speech or comments, I mean, it's, it's, it's just, disgust- it was just so disgusting. Yeah. And, and the thing is, is that, you know, this is how, I mean, this wasn't in 2013. The, oh. the, their offices caught fire, I think around 2019 or 2020. So this is recent. And the mindset of many people is that, you know, there are many people who still, have have a lot of hatred towards the LGBTQ community. And it's recently, um, recently I've been seeing the news about what's been going on in um, in Uganda. 
and also recently in Ghana, like uh, last year in Uganda, the government passed a the Anti-Homosexuality Act. I mean, when I read the reasons for bring, bringing this, this uh, su such a disgusted, despicable law, I mean, I mean, I was at a loss for words that the government was sanctioned and promote the hatred towards a community that has done absolutely nothing to harm them. And without presenting any evidence that own that it's exclusively homosexuals or the LGBTQ community that is raping children or that they are luring children into homosexuality. That is just complete nonsense. And these are the type, these are the same, these are the type, same dumb arguments that I remember hearing in the news like during the 19 in the 1990s or even the late 1980s, okay, to justify to justify the persecution of this community. And it's just plain wrong. Given the fact that given the fact that Uganda and many former colonies, okay, many mm. former colonies, um they share these views, okay, and they're using the Bible to justify these actions. But whenever I meet someone who tells me that, that the Bible says that you shouldn't do that, I remind, especially if they're a black person, I remind them that when the colonizers from Europe came into Africa and basically pilfered the entire continent and enslaved black people and brought them over to the Caribbean, over into yeah. Brazil, those same people sent the church, sent missionaries, Christian missionaries, into Africa and all throughout the world to teach them, teach the, the same black people that they are inferior to white people or that, you know, the Bible, they actually use the Bible to justify enslaving or even yeah. colonizing. Okay? Yeah, more I like, remind them of that okay, I think, okay. sorry, sorry to cut you short, more like using religion as a tool for slavery yeah i think that that's it right i've had a conversation with someone who writes about um enslavement etc about this you know deeper historical titus to more like using religion as a tool for slavery mm -hmm. and it's actually quite sad to get to know about the death of the jamaican boy i never heard about that you know so many things get to pass on that you never get to know on the internet yeah. space, yeah. This is my first time hearing about that. That's such a yeah. huge book, really, based off yeah, the real life experience. It was really, it was really deplorable what I read. I mean, it was very shocking, and it disturbed me so much. And I'll let you in on a little secret. Well, it's not so much of a secret right now. When I first wrote Chill Run, yeah, Chill Run. When I first wrote it, it was only meant to, it was only meant to be a standalone, like a one book mm. standalone. I wanted to concentrate on writing spy novels. So when uh, when I wrote Pandora Succession, mm. I knew that there was going to be a sequel because I planned oh. for, for it to be a series. So there's Pandora Succession. Then there is a short story trilogy called Unsavory Delicacies. And then when I was ready to write a full-length novel, I came up with the, the Demeter Code as well. Mm. That's, what I, um, that's what I planned to do. There were... I'd never originally planned to have a sequel to Chill Run, okay? Mm. But when I read about Dwayne Jones and what happened to him, the story was so disturbing, and I couldn't get the I couldn't get it out of my head. What happened to him? I mean, it's not just what happened to him. is It's not just the fact that he was killed. It was the way that he was killed. That's what stuck with me the most, mm, and it just and it just it just it just made me wonder. Smaller. I mean, how could anyone be so sick? You'd have to be a real sick, disturbed person to kill. I mean, just killing anyone for just because of the color of their skin, or because of their religion, or just because because of their sexuality. Okay, I mean, it's a hate crime. It's a very vicious hate crime, but. This is the most vicious hate crime that I can think of in recent history. Okay. Mm. What would drive someone to what would drive someone or a group of people to think that it's okay to kill someone or to harm someone because they're different? Okay. Yeah. So I mean 
I couldn't get it out of my head. And eventually, I was saying to myself, I could write a story about this. Yeah. But I was thinking, could I write a spy novel about this? I said, no, this would not be a spy novel. But I was thinking, what if I were to bring back Eddie Barrow? <laughs> and Eddie Barrow, <laughs> if I were to bring back Eddie Barrow and put him in Jamaica in a He's similar situation where he was a witness, what would he do? And it just it just occurred to me. I said, look, I can, write a, I can write an Eddie Barrow sequel. And yeah. that's how wow. Jamron was. Yeah, that's amazing. Actually, you know, we can actually go on and on and on and on. Well, you know, we have all the all the questions to explore in the interview. So thank you so much for mentioning about the making of this. Sounds quite, you know, pooling and quite controversial, like you mentioned. Yeah. So thank you for mentioning. And Law, you know, I've always been fascinated about our authors, especially novelists like yourself, craft long sentences and bring us together, just like we've seen in the book you just talked mm -hmm. about, in a way that it eventually makes a great novel. And this always leaves me thinking about how exactly they got their ideas and inspirations, you know. And as far as writing is concerned, I'd love to ask you too, how do you get your inspirations and ideas? Where do they come from? Well, my ideas and my inspiration, they come from all over the place. Um, as as I mentioned before, Chill Run was basically was loosely based on my experience as as, as an off, as an author when I oh, started out. Wow. But also, it was inspired by it was also inspired by the I don't know if you've heard about it, but um, the New York State Governor, a former New York State Governor, his name was Elliot Spitzer. He got into hot water when he was exposed to. Um, he was exposed as a client of a of a high priced prostitute. <laughs> okay. Wow. And uh, he got busted. And the thing is, is that he got busted, and his um, I mean, his political career just went downhill as a result of that. But wow. the the girl, the girl that he was with, her I, I can't remember her. First, I think it's Ashley Dupre. I think that's her name. Um, <laughs> she, she became very popular. Story. She became very popular as a result of of that scandal. So that's how I got wow. the idea. Of Eddie Barrow is a struggling author. So this is how the the um, publicity stunt that Eddie and his friends um, came up with. Okay. This is how I felt that this could be actually realistic. Okay, mm. but I just added a twist to it. Okay. Nice. But so most so my ideas come from all over the place. I told you where I got the idea for Jam Run. So yeah, that's that. Um, that that speaks very much for itself. And you know, as I said before, Jam Run is still relevant today, even more relevant today, more than ever. Um, I can tell you a story In of Africa. very a, a very interesting. There's a there's a very interesting young man, um, from Uganda. His name is. I think um, I hope I hope I pronounced the name uh, correctly. His name is Stephen Kabuye, okay, and he is an LGBTQ activist, okay. And what happened was is that he was um, on his last February of this year, he was on his morning commute when two men on a motorcycle accosted him. And they attacked him and stabbed him repeatedly. Wow. And Just left like them that. for and left yes, and left them for dead. Okay. And they fled and they left them for dead. And from what I recall from his account, from Stephen's account, there were witnesses and they did not lift a finger to help him. Even they saw that he was suffering and he was bleeding. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's... He was bleeding. That's and what he had, and what he had to eventually do, what he eventually had to do, he had um, to take a cell phone, and I think he had to do, he had to record himself, do a live social mm. media, and basically cry out for help. And eventually, one of his friends recognized him and came to his aid, and managed to get him to the hospital. You know what the police did? The police, instead of asking questions. On, yeah, the, the police were not interested in who attacked him. The police, they questioned the friend that came to his aid. 
and accuse wow. him of being his boyfriend. <laughs> you know, okay? <laughs> that they were in a homosexual relationship. Police wow. did not have proof. They didn't have any proof. They were not interested in who stabbed Stephen. They weren't interested in that. They were they flipped it around and tried to blame, find a find any reason to arrest both of them. Okay. And there was wow. even there, there was, and I recall from an interview that uh, Stephen did with, I think it was with the BBC, I think, or with another media outlet. He mentioned that the police did not even open an investigation. But yet, when news of his attack, okay, spread, yeah. a, a police person, spokesperson claimed that Stephen had inflicted those wounds on himself. Wow. Can you imagine that? That he inflicted those wounds on himself. And even the, the um, uh, of course, the government of Uganda, there are government officials that claim that um, he had, those wounds were self-inflicted or that wow. it was all photoshopped, it was all fake, it wasn't true, all sorts of things. And the nasty things, the nasty comments that I still see to this day on Twitter, okay, where I first, um, where I first um, met Stephen online, virtually, you know, mm -hmm. I mean... And all I can say is that Stephen Kabuye is one of the bravest men I know. Okay, oh. go through that. I mean, to be left for dead. Okay, attacked oh. savagely like that. It reminded me of Dwayne Jones. The only difference is is that Stephen survived, and he managed to flee Uganda, and he's now safely here in Canada. Okay, mm. I believe there is an LGBTQ. Um, organization i can't remember which one is it rainbow corley i can't remember the name of it but th they facilitated his travel to um safe um safe travel out of uganda to come to canada okay well, so well i I, mean, I think it's a very you know we know that in africa all of these things might not be very much acceptable but killing people because of the sexuality i think on itself it's wickedness you know it's it, it's it's a crime towards humanity on itself. Just several places where all I can say is that um, you are not born <laughs> hating anyone. Sure, I can I, I I can go to a shopping mall, okay, and a little baby, I mean um, a little toddler. I've had toddlers, um, little boys, or little girls who come up to me, like little white girls or Asian children, they or Indian children. They've come up to me, okay. And they smile at me. And I recall one time, <laughs> this was years ago. This is this is back in the days of uh, VHS, before we had the, um, yeah, I don't think we had the internet back then. This is the days of VHS where we had to rent our movies from, we didn't have Netflix back then. We had oh. to rent movies from the video store. And I remember oh. being at the video store one, I remember I being at the video store that. one evening and I was uh, I was trying to pass I was trying to pass uh, a mother and his and her her toddler son. He must have been no older than like uh, two or three, and he got separated from the mother. And I think he was looking at one of the videos on the shelves. And his mother said, "Come along." And I just happened to be walking by, and the thing is, I th I guess he felt he bumped into my hand, yeah, and without even looking. By default, he just grabbed my hand, and next thing I know, I'm, I said, who's this holding my hand, walking with me? And I look down, I see this little boy, <laughs> and he's completely oblivious that I'm not his mother, but he's oh. walking with me. And wow. I said, uh, okay, I better I better um, stop right now because I don't <laughs> want to be a kidnapping or attempted kidnapping, a black, a black <laughs> man, a young black man, and... This little white child, everyone's going to be looking at me. <laughs> the truth yeah. is, the mother, the mother saw what happened, and she was giggling. She was laughing the whole time. Wow. And what that means? She said in French, "Je pense qu'il vous aime," <laughs> which means, "I think he likes you." <laughs> uh. <laughs> I said, "Children are children are not born. They're not born to hate anyone. The only reason why children hate is because they're adults." Will teach them instill, hate. yeah, indoctrination, you know, yeah, that's true. So, so I mean, that's this true. Is, uh... so I think, same thing to apply to racism, more like you see a young 
a white boy and a young white girl having fun, enjoying themselves, you know, playing together. But as they begin to grow, is what the adults teach the small generation that want to spike yep. off hatred. It even happened, you know, even in the black community where you're like, okay, uh, don't play with the neighbor's friends because of what your mom told you, you know, all of those things cause... Anyway, it's it's a crazy world out there. <laughs> I don't know, I mean, yeah, I mean, I could I could go on and on and on and on about that. <laughs> Absolutely, but, I know that we only have a set limit of time. Where, <laughs> yeah, but I'm... anyways, jam in jam run. It's inspired by several several true events, and if you look in, and if you even look in the back, I even wrote, I kept a whole list of references. Okay. Oh. To back up to to corroborate the story or corroborate the facts of the story, and mm. basically nobody can tell me that this would never happen in real life because it has in the past. And as I said, with Stephen Stephen Kubuye, it happened yeah. again in 2024. The only difference is that Stephen survived his attack, whereas Dwayne Jones didn't. Yeah. Thank you for mentioning. I love the sound of it. Now, apart from the books we've mentioned so far, do you have any other works you've authored or say currently working on? Well, as I said, um, as I said earlier, I have three of the books: Pandora Succession, which was my first book; Chill mm. Run was my second book. Actually, no, Unsavory Unsavory Delicacies was my no. Sorry, Chill Run was my second book. Um, Unsavory Delicacies was my third book. And then came Pandora the Demeter Succession. Code. Yeah. Pandora Succession and uh, Unsavory Delicacies and the Demeter Code. That's part of the Ridley Fox Nita Paris series. So oh. these are spy thrillers. And that's and great. I, I'm a big, big, I'm a big fan of, I was, since, since I was a youngster, I was a big fan of, of, uh, of spy, spy, um, spy movies. I, I, I watched James Bond. I watched um, um I watched Mission Impossible, but um even though Mission Impossible came on before I was born, I saw one or two reruns when I was like four, three or four years old. Okay. Mm. And I and then there was Scarecrow and Mrs. King, and then there was the Born Identity. Oh, I love these movies and the Mission Impossible series, but I mean I had my idea of uh, of writing a spy novel based yeah. on based on um, let's say make it more scientific because I have a biology degree and I use yeah. my biology degree my knowledge of biology to create a fictional biological weapon oh. and that's how I came up with Pandora Succession and mm -hmm. it's interesting it's interesting that um, I always um, try to keep my stories even though they're fiction I try to keep keep them as realistic as possible. I don't want anyone to say, well, that would never happen in real life. That would never happen mm. in real life. I do a lot of research. I consult with specialists, okay, when I'm um, when I'm preparing my outline. Because I want to make sure that when I write the book, when it's published, the last thing I want is someone to say, well, that would never happen in real life because of this, this, and that, and that. Yeah. No. I make sure I have all my bases covered. Maybe I was less experienced when I wrote Pandora Secession, but I was still pretty close, okay, to keeping it as real as possible. Yeah. And the funny yeah. thing is, is that um, my editor yeah. at the time, I don't, um, she's not the same editor I have right now, because um, she passed away. Oh. And, yeah, but that's a so long sorry time ago. About that. Yeah, thank you. She passed away. At least I believe she passed away because I lost I lost touch with her in my last email a couple of years ago I sent. It was her son that picked it up. Mm. Picked up the email and he said that this um that she's now in a home and and um this email address is is going to be closed permanently. So she's currently in a home. She's not she can't do much. So I tried searching for her online. And there's not much activity, so I can only assume that she, she's either in a nursing home or she must have passed away because mm. I can't find the, I can't um, find anything on her. But anyhow, as I was saying, she first told me that 
the fictional biological weapon that I had for Pandora's succession, she said it was a, in her opinion, it was a bit too unrealistic. Okay. Wow. However, about two years, about a year and a half to two years after the book was published, yeah, there was, uh, there was big news out of Siberia of of a um, let's say the poet like. All I can say, all I can say about Pandora's succession, it it's about a prehistoric microbe that mm. was accidentally unearthed in the polar ice caps, primarily due to global warming, but also because a group of scientists were were doing a doing an ex were were doing an expedition up north, and they oh. accidentally unearthed this hyper deadly microbe. Okay. Yeah. No, the thing is, is that the thing is that um as I said, my editor told me she doesn't believe this is real really realistic. But however, about a year and a half to two years after the book was published, yeah, there was news out of Siberia that a a prehistoric <laughs> macro virus wow. oh. had resurfaced due to global warming. Wow. Okay. And guess what it was called? They decided to call it Pandora. Well, <laughs> would you believe that my editor, she wrote me back with that article and the subject matter, the first words she had in her email, she said, Russell, I apologize. You were right all along, okay? <laughs> you were on something, okay? Because here it is, okay? Here's the actual story mm. of a real occurrence of a prehistoric virus yeah. being on Earth due to global warming. Yeah. And it was just ironic. It's just ironic that scientists called it the Pandora macrovirus. Okay. Oh wow. So she That's wrote me such to say a Russell, coincidence. That Russell, I take it back. <laughs> okay. well, look, I study biology. I know uh. how these Okay, I have yeah. a general understanding of how viruses and microbes work. The only difference is, is that in my book, Pandora's Succession, it's not a virus, it's a microbe. So mm. there's a difference. <laughs> yeah, sounds like historical fiction. Thank you for sharing. And I'd oh. like to hear your advice on this, just in case we have some people who are out there see, trying to write or you know publish a book, struggling writers. What sort of advice would you give people in this category? Well, my advice, uh, my advice to um, aspiring authors is the same advice I've been giving for years. Um, don't stop, don't stop writing. That's the first thing, and yeah. that's actually advice that was given to me by a New York Times bestselling author. His name oh. is Joseph Finder, and I love his books. I've read most. I think I've read all of his books except for one, but. All of his books, I've always, I've enjoyed all of his books. They're real page turners. They're beautifully written. The plots are really gripping. And basically, I wanted to be a bit like him. Mm. Like, that's great. So, that's the first piece of advice. Don't stop writing. Number two, um, just for sure, many authors believe that or I should say the beginning authors, they believe that the way to make it in this industry, you have to be published by a publisher. And I said, that's not true. That yeah. may have been true once upon a time, but the truth is, the world once has upon changed. a time, yeah, but back then, when that was true, publishers were more interested in art, not just money, okay? They were interested primarily in art, okay? Mm. Today's publishing industry is only about money. Okay. <laughs> ask yourself, how is it that ask yourself, how is it that someone um like if I were to ask you, if I were to write a book right now and I approach a publisher, okay, I can tell you right now, back when back when I wrote Pandora Succession, I had I queried several literary agents, and there are many of them that read the first chapter and they enjoyed it and they asked me to send the whole book, send the entire manuscript. OK, I always got my hopes up and there were quite a few that asked to read the entire manuscript. And then they wrote back to me and said that 
sorry, I can't find a publisher. None of my publishers I, I'm associated with are, mm. are accepting this type of work right now. Okay. Oh. And I mean, I, I went on and on and I, I, I literally killed myself trying to land up a, a book deal. Okay. It was only when I met my, my content editor, when I stumbled on her, her website. Okay. The one I was speaking about earlier, she told me like Russell, okay. Publishers nowadays, they're only interested in money. Okay. Yeah. Me, unfortunately, I don't have a big, big platform. Okay. Anyone ask who's Russell Brooks? People say, well, I've never heard of Russell Brooks before. Okay. But yeah. ask, them, ask them if they've heard of Kim Kardashian. Okay. Everyone, almost everyone has heard of Kim Kardashian. Okay. Mm. Now, I can tell you one thing. I can tell you one thing that's a fact. Had I been friends, imagine if I had been friends, very good friends with Kim Kardashian. Okay. Like wow. we're buddy buddies, okay? And I was struggling to write Pandora. I'm, I was I was struggling to get Pandora Succession on the market, being published by a traditional um, publisher. I would have no success. Imagine if I had an agreement with her, where I wrote the, I'd write the book, and all she would do is put her name on the book cover, yeah, as yeah. as the author, okay? Wow, and she presented it as her book, even though I was one who had ghostwritten it. Trust wow. me. Believe you me. Every single literary agent will be banging on her door. Okay? To get uh, ready to sign a book deal with her. And there, mm. every, there was very few publishers who would turn down a book deal written by Kim Kardashian. Why? Because Kim Kardashian already has a fan base. I think on Instagram yeah. alone, she has she has a few million followers on Instagram wow. alone. That's okay. a lot. I don't know the exact amount, but she she already has an established platform. The name Kardashian is a it is already a brand name. Okay. Yeah. So the thing is, the publisher would not have to spend as much in publicity to promote a book when all Kim Gar Kim Kardashian has to do is just take the book, go on her Instagram page, and say, "Look." <laughs> This is coming out in the next few weeks. Okay. <laughs> yeah. There'll be pre pre-orders. You'd have pre-orders from here to, from Montreal to, to Great Britain. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for your advice, really. They're quite helpful. And I'm hoping yeah. that viewers would love to utilize it. And just in case oh, we no, have some oh, interest. One last, one, okay, yeah. one last thing. Okay. Um, I would recommend I'd recommend to authors, I begin authors, okay. Try try the traditional route. Contact 10 agents and 10 publishers. Okay. Yeah. If you're rejected by all of them, then go the independent route. Okay. But yeah. just make sure that you work with people who work in the literary agency. I mean, the literary industry. Okay. You yeah. want to find a freelance, you want to make sure you find a freelance editor who has experience. Um, editing novels okay you don't want a school teacher you don't want your Sunday school teacher you don't want your parents or grandparents I'm sure they all mean well but they don't have the experience they don't have the education or the the know-how the professional know-how of what publishers are looking for yeah okay? make sure you get a professional editor okay and, and if you have problems finding a professional editor Go on Google and find your local writers association or authors yeah. association. Become a member and ask them who do they recommend. Yeah. And I'm sure I'm sure um they won't have any difficulty finding an editor. Okay. Yeah. It's important to have beta readers. Okay. Because you, as the author, you will never spot your mistakes. So it's always important to have a beta reader. Okay. Yeah. Read your book, okay, or read your manuscript to catch any factual or any content errors, okay? Yeah. Like, I wrote, um, like, um, for instance, when I wrote the Demeter Code, okay, I, I wrote a sex scene. It was my very first sex scene, okay? And I wanted to make sure that I did it right. Fortunately, I was very well acquainted with New York Times bestselling author Eric Jerome Dickey. Okay. Yeah. And I do have a picture of him holding 
holding my book, The Demeter Code, on my website. Okay. Oh, that's an amazing like, marketing strategy. Yeah. I contacted him and, and because I've read many of his books and I know he deals with a lot of um, black romance and there's a lot of sex scenes in his books as well. So I decided to contact, I contacted him and I just asked him if he could just read over the sex scene and tell me if there's anything wrong or if there's anything that needs improving or changing. And mm. he said, Russell, send it over. Here's my email address. Send it over right now. Okay. Wow. That's and, amazing. And he got back to me like, um, he got back to me less than half hour later. He got back to me and he said, Russell, it's perfect. Except just delete this, delete these three words in this sentence of dialogue right here. And, wow. and the, and he explained to me and he told me why. He told me, like, Russell, these three words, okay, to the average person, the, uh, is, they're not going to think anything of it. However, if a rape survivor were yeah. to read those three words, boom, it's going to come. Great. They're going to see it differently, and rightfully so. And this is something that could ruin your career, your reputation. Yeah. And it's only when he explained that I said to myself, oh, my goodness, I can't believe it. It's just a case of me being in the moment that I had my blinders on. But this is the reason why beta readers or it's important to cons consult with experts. Okay. Yeah. People with experience who can spot mistakes that the average person would not spot. Okay. Like um, it's the same thing with Jam Run. Okay. With Jam Run, I consulted with... Um, local jamaicans That's my advice to <laughs> begin an author. yeah okay. yeah thank you so much actually for your advice and i'm hoping that viewers would love to utilize it and just in case we have some interested viewers who are currently watching this interview i would love to get any of russell brooks books directly they are available on amazon they're available on other platform as well which i've left a link in the description part of this interview too so thank you so much, Rosa. I know we can go on and on talking about this for our safety yeah. invitation to come on right. P English Literature. It's awesome having this conversation with you. Oh, I'm so I had a lot of fun. I'm glad I'm glad you invited me. <laughs> thank you. That was fun, really.